Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. For those that don't know me, my name is Michael Siddle and I'm the chairman of Ramsey Healthcare. On behalf of the board and management, I extend to you a warm welcome to the company's 2020 annual meeting. And I hope you are able to see on the slides that preceded the meeting, some of our facilities and some of our people and the way that they support each other. We're very proud of that. I'm informed, that we have a, I'm informed we have a quorum present and accordingly I declare this meeting open. Sadly, in response to government restrictions and the potential health risks arriving from the COVID-19 pandemic, the board determined to hold this annual meeting virtually. We very much appreciate your understanding at this challenging time and for joining our virtual meeting. It's not something that we really enjoy doing, but unfortunately, like most other companies, we have to do it this way. We've published on our website and on the ASX an online AGM guide. And I'll ask Henrietta, our group general counsel and company secretary, to go through the technical and procedural matters for the AGM shortly. Now, let me introduce your board of directors. Firstly, on my right is Craig McNally, our CEO. Then I have Peter Evans, our deputy chairman. On the end here is Karen Penrose, our newest director, and I'll talk about her a little later. Next to me is Henrietta Rowe, who is our group general counsel and company secretary. Then we have David Fody, um, who's a, been on the board now for three years, I think, is it, David? Mm. Alison Deans and James McMurdo, who has been here for 12 months. Sadly, uh, Claudia susmuth dickerhoff can't be here because of the travel restrictions, but she's online out there somewhere. I know she's listening in. Also with me today is Doug Bain from our external auditor, Ernst & Young, who is available to answer any questions that shareholders might have concerning the conduct of the audit, preparation and content of the auditor's report, the company's accounting policies and the auditor's independence. We welcome and thank Doug for his attendance today and also his very capable assistance, Vida. I'll now ask Henry Ota to talk through the procedural matters for this meeting. Sadly, they are lengthy but important. It'll cover how to ask a question and the voting procedures for the meeting. Thank you, Chairman. We are taking questions from shareholders of ordinary shares today or their representatives. You can submit questions at any time. You do not need to wait until the relevant item of business. We encourage you to submit your questions as soon as possible. We will then seek to address your questions during the discussion on the appropriate item of business. We will endeavour to answer as many questions from shareholders as we can. To ask a question, select the speech bubble icon at the top of your screen. This will open a new screen where you can type your question. Once you have finished typing, please hit the arrow symbol to send. Once sent, you will briefly see a received notification. Questions sent via the online meeting platform will be moderated to avoid repetition. If questions are particularly lengthy, we may need to summarise them in the interests of time. We have also received some questions from shareholders in advance of the meeting today. These will be addressed during the course of the meeting. If your question relates to a personal experience at one of our hospitals, we will contact you after the meeting to follow up. We are not able to address these kinds of questions during the meeting, including due to privacy issues. If you would like a copy of the minutes of Ramsey's 2019 annual general meeting to be sent to you, please contact boardroom and this will be arranged. Voting today will be conducted by way of a poll on all items of business. In order to provide you with enough time to vote, polling on items two, to five is open now. Item six is a conditional resolution and polling will open on item six only if required following the result of item two, the adoption of the remuneration report. If you are eligible to vote at this meeting, you will see a polling icon at the top of your screen. This icon resembles a small bar graph and is to the right of the speech bubble icon. Selecting this icon will bring up the list of resolutions and present you with voting options. To cast your vote, simply select one of the options. There is no need to hit a submit or enter button as the vote is automatically recorded. You can change your vote up until the time the chairman declares voting closed. The chairman will give you a warning before he closes voting. Any appointed proxy who has been given discretion on how to vote should vote in the same manner. 
any appointed proxy that has been directed how to vote and has no discretionary votes to cast, does not need to vote as these votes will automatically be counted in accordance with those directions. If you experience any difficulties with the online platform, select the information icon at the top of your screen and the helpline number will be displayed. I will now hand back to our chairman. Thanks, Henrietta. I hope that wasn't too complicated. Um, I'll now give a short overview of the past year, after which Craig will give you a more detailed presentation. This year I'm pleased, in fact I'm very pleased, to introduce our newest director, Karen Penrose, who joined us in February and is seeking election at today's meeting. She has had an extensive career in leadership and CFO roles, primarily in financial services. Karen is also a director of Vicinity Centres, the Bank of Queensland and Estia Health. She has taken over as chair of the Audit Committee and is also a member of the Risk Management Committee. She's made already a valuable contribution to the board since joining in February, as we have navigated through the COVID-19 crisis and the impact on our group's operations, and I welcome her. Karen's appointment follows a structured board succession plan over the last two years with the retirement of Rod McGill, Kerry Roxburgh and Bruce Soden, and the appointment of Claudia, Alison, James, along with Karen, as the new directors. As part of the changes to the composition of our board, in July this year, David Thody took on the role of Chair of the Nomination and Governance Committee and the role of Lead Independent Director. The key function of the Lead Independent Director is to ensure that any conflicts of interest between the company and its major shareholder, the Paul Ramsey Foundation, are identified and appropriately managed. And I'm happy to say so far, we haven't had anything to deal with. As part of our ongoing succession planning, Peter Evans has flagged that he intends to retire at the end of his current three-year term at next year's AGM. Peter has been a very engaged and active non-executive director of Ramsey Healthcare since his appointment in 1990, and prior to that as an executive joining us in 1969. He was very young then, I must admit. <laughs> the board is very conscious of the need to ensure that the expertise and significant collective experience of the longer standing directors of the board is preserved. And Peter will no doubt work closely with our recently appointed directors to share his insight and his vast knowledge. The board also believes that the interests of shareholders are best met at this time by my continued contribution as chairman. And to this end, I stand for re-election today. Joining us today also, we have our new group chief financial officer, Martin Roberts, who started with us late in April this year. Martin has had a baptism of fire joining the week of the capital raising in late April and has already made an instrumental contribution to managing the financial impacts of the health crisis in Ramsey. I would also like to very much thank Mike Herner, our Greek Deputy CFO, who stepped in as acting CFO after Bruce Soden stepped down at last year's annual meeting after 31 years. Thank you, Mike. Before I get to the financial results, on behalf of the board and all shareholders, I'd like to thank Craig, the Ramsey leadership team and all our staff across the globe for their enormous contribution steering the company through the COVID-19 pandemic. It was never easy, I must tell you. The teams have worked tirelessly side by side with the doctors and the public sector to fight the impact of the pandemic and where possible, improve the outcomes for our people infected or at risk from the virus. I would also sadly like to extend the board's sympathies to our staff who fell ill from the virus. And in particular, I'd like to send our condolences to the families of two of our team members who unfortunately passed away from this disease in the last six months. In 2019, the World Health Organization named 2020 the year of the nurse and midwife, as it marks the bicentenary of the birth of the face of modern nursing, Florence Nightingale. It's hard to imagine that the World Health Organization could made, uh, have made a more percipient call. Ramsey has chosen to mark this year by profiling one nurse or midwife from a different region of our business each week for the entire year. The campaign has been designed to highlight the vital role that these people play in delivering excellent healthcare services. We hope these profiles assist the understanding of the vital work and investment 
needed in the nursing and midwifery workforce to meet future global health challenges. Now turning to our fiscal year 2020 financial results. Ramsey reported a core net profit after tax of $336.9 million, delivering earnings per share of 156.4 cents. The Board of Directors declared a fully franked interim dividend of 62.5 cents per share in February this year. However, in line with our announcement in April, the Board did not declare a final dividend. Now, I know the decision not to declare a final dividend would have disappointed some of you who have depend on these dividends for your income. However, it was deemed not appropriate in the current environment to be paying out dividends. The payment of dividends in financial year 2021 will be considered by the Board in the normal course prior to the release of the company's interim results in February next year. And let me say, we are very keen on reinstating that dividend when we can. The fiscal 2020 results reflect the significant impact that COVID has had on our global operations in the final four months of the fiscal year. During this, year, this period, our resources were directed towards protecting our staff, doctors and patients on the front line of the crisis, supporting governments with national responses to the pandemic and assisting the communities in which we operate across Australia, Europe and the UK and Asia. The assistance being provided by Ramsey to the public sector is ongoing and very important and reflects the different situations in each region in terms of the severity of the impact of COVID-19. Craig will highlight that as a result of COVID-19 continuing to impact the activity in some of our regions, this will also affect our fiscal 2021 results. The board believes that there are too many uncertainties in the profile of the recovery in some of the markets we operate to quantify the ongoing impact of the pandemic at this stage. As you're aware, in April, given the un significant uncertainty in the operating environment at the time, the board made the decision to undertake an equity raising through an institutional placement and a share purchase plan, which ultimately raised $1.5 billion. Both the placement and the share purchase plan were oversubscribed and the board would like to thank all shareholders who supported the raising. And the good news is the share price has gone up since. The equity raising has strengthened Ramsey's balance sheet and liquidity position, as well as increasing our financial flexibility. This places us in a strong position to deal with the impact of the pandemic on our business. More importantly, the capital has allowed us to continue to invest in our organic organic growth initiatives and positions us to take advantage of any opportunities that may arise as the world emerges from the crisis. And as we say, we're always looking for opportunities. As a global company employing over 77,000 staff and caring for over 8 million patients each year, the Ramsey Board recognises that we have a responsibility to ensure we are maintaining the highest standards of quality, safety and sustainability. During the fiscal year 2020, Ramsey has undertaken a review of our sustainability strategy, and as a result, we have developed a global focus areas under the title of Ramsey Cares. Our approach to sustainability and any material, social and environmental risks are overseen by the board's Global Risk Management Committee. A number of initiatives are already being launched by the business, and Craig will tell you more about those in his presentation. I'd like to close by once again thanking all our shareholders for your ongoing support. I believe that our global team's response to the pandemic has highlighted the strength of the Ramsey culture and the pervasiveness with which our philosophy, people caring for people, guides our employees and drives our actions. The board is extremely proud of the way our people have stepped up during the crisis and I'd like to thank them again for their dedication. I'll now hand over to Craig, who will give you a more detailed presentation in relation to our response to the COVID pandemic and an update on the operating environment. Thanks, Michael. And I'd like to add my welcome to shareholders joining us today via the virtual platform. Today, I'd like to give you an update on the current operating environment, including Ramsey's ongoing response to the COVID-19 pandemic a brief overview of our FY20 financial results, an overview of our approach to, uh, to sustainability, 
and reaffirm the strategic outlook for the business. As Michael has indicated, with the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic in March, and in the face of what was a rapidly evolving situation, our focus was on the sustainability of our business and ensuring we protect, protected the well-being of our employees, our patients and our clinicians. During this period, I'm very proud to say, Ramsey led the private hospital industry across our regions, <coughs> working closely with government to make our facilities and services available and fully staffed to fight the pandemic and support national efforts in the regions in which we operate. As you'll have seen in our annual report and on the slide reel before the meeting, there are numerous examples of Ramsey employees responding and rising to the challenge of the unprecedented conditions created by the pandemic. In Australia, we entered partnership agreements with governments in the major states in which we operate to maintain full capacity and to make our facilities available to assist with the national response efforts. Joondalup Health Campus in Western Australia was one of the first facilities in the country to treat a large cohort of COVID-19 patients, which were from the Artania cruise ship. As the second wave hit Victoria, we assisted the public sector in caring for COVID patients, while many of our nurses went above and beyond to assist in aged care facilities impacted by the pandemic. In Europe, our facilities in France, Italy and Sweden have been at the forefront of the crisis caring for over 7,000 COVID patients. Our hospitals in Europe are now responding to the second wave. At the current time, Ramsey Sante facilities are treating over 800 COVID patients with more than 300 of those patients in critical care. The business is working closely with the French government and the public sector to treat patients and we will increase capacity where required through deferring non-urgent surgeries. In the UK, in the face of the second wave, our hospitals have had to make some capacity available to the NHS in regions where there have been more severe outbreaks. The business will continue to work closely with the NHS to assist the public sector as required. I am pleased to say that no Ramsey employees have been stood down because of the pandemic. However, the impact of COVID on our staff and doctors has been significant. In particular, in the Northern Hemisphere, we continue to look at avenues to assist with staff fatigue and mental health as they face another period of elevated stress and crisis management. We have implemented stringent new safety and clinical quality protocols, guidelines on social distancing and PPE use, and adopted patient and visitor screening and visitor restrictions to ensure maximum safety, safety for our staff, patients and doctors. Ramsey employees continue to work to support our communities, helping local businesses, uh, so for example, by purchasing meals for our staff during the pandemic. We have leveraged the global scale of our business to ensure appropriate management of supplies of equipment, PPE and medicines. We also utilised our digital technology to flex our capacity to deliver consultations and programs virtually. In summary, the pandemic has and will continue for some time to be an incredible challenge for the organisation, one that I believe Ramsey has proven it is equal to. In the process, we have cemented our role as a leading healthcare and hospital provider further strengthening our relationship with governments in the regions in which we operate. Turning now briefly to our FY20 financial performance. Ramsey performed well in the first half of FY20 and at the end of February, we were on track to meet our EPS guidance. In March, the pandemic had a material impact on the company's activities across all regions. And it was evident very quickly that our guidance for the full year was no longer going to be achievable 
and was thus withdrawn. The impact of COVID, combined with the previously flagged changes to the lease accounting standards, make the FY20 key financial results difficult to interpret. However, on a like-for-like -like basis, under the old accounting standard, core NPAT for the year was down 34.4%. Importantly, free cash, free cash flow for the year was strong, reflecting in part the cash received as part of the government programs provided in all our major regions. And that was in return for us effectively making our facilities available for use by the public sector to support the fight against COVID. Strong cash flow, combined with the proceeds of the $1.5 billion equity raising in April, has resulted in a strengthened balance sheet and has enhanced our financial flexibility. Significantly, for the long-term growth and the sustainability of the operating platform, the investment in the business, both in brownfield development and maintenance, has not declined as a result of the pandemic. Moving on to an update on what is going on across our different regions. I'll start with Australia. So in, in Australia in March, we entered partnership agreements with governments in New South, New South Wales, Queensland, Victoria and Western Australia to maintain full capacity and make our facilities available to assist with the state and federal government's COVID response. Agreements were paused or ceased on 30 June 2020 as the lockdowns were lifted and elective surgery restrictions eased. However, restrictions were reintroduced in Victoria as the second wave of cases hit and we recommenced the agreement with the state government on the 23rd of July. Our Victorian hospitals operated primarily in a cost recovery environment during the second lockdown. The restrictions on elective surgery in Victoria started to ease at the end of September and only yesterday we moved to 100% unrestricted capacity. As we've seen in other states, since the easing of restrictions, surgery volumes in Victoria have started to return. In the first quarter of FY21, which is the three month uh, to 30 September, surgical admissions in Australia increased 1.7%. Um, so excluding Victoria, that was up 8% on the previous corresponding period. Demand for other services, including medical, mental health, obstetrics and rehabilitation, uh, were below the previous corresponding period for the quarter, however, have started to improve in recent weeks. These factors drove a 1.5% increase in total revenue for the first quarter of FY21 compared to the previous corresponding period. Costs have remained at elevated levels due to the impact of COVID including increased use and cost of PPE, additional staffing associated with screening in our facilities and facilities management. The monthly increase in additional costs in Australia over the quarter has been in the order of eight to $9 million. And that's inclusive of the impact of the COVID restrictions on volume related procurement benefits. Australian EBITDAR for the September quarter declined compared to the previous corresponding period, with approximately half the decrease due to restricted surgical activity in Victoria, and the other half due to increased costs and reduced procurement benefits as a result of operating in a COVID safe environment, combined with a negative mix impact <coughs> from the decrease in medical mental health and rehabilitation case volumes. The result was also impacted by the transfer of the Mildura Hospital back to the Victorian State Government on the 14th of September. Ramsey continue to engage with the public sector to explore opportunities that may exist to assist with addressing waiting lists in the public system moving forward. Investment in brownfield and selected greenfield developments remains a key focus with investment in the expansion of services at our larger hospital campuses. In FY21, investment projects included uh, North Shore Health Hub, which is an expansion of the North Shore Private Hospital, and investment in the facilities at Westmead Private to meet the demand and population growth in the catchment area. In late September, 
we announced that Danny Sims, the CEO of our Australian business, would be transitioning to retirement following a 17-year career with Ramsey Healthcare. And effective from the 1st of October, Carmel Monaghan was appointed the Chief Executive Officer to lead our Australian operations. Carmel joined Ramsey Healthcare in 1998 and has worked across hospital, corporate and global positions for over two decades, playing a key role in the company's successful growth during that time. Carmel has recently announced changes to the Australian management structure, incorporating a number of new senior leadership roles which are um, put in place to enable us to execute on our strategy going forward. And so some of those roles were a Chief Operating Officer for Out of Hospital, um, and that will have a focus on pharmacy, hospital in the home, uh, Ramsey uh, Health Plus, which is our uh, outpatient rehabilitation business, community-based mental health and our standalone day surgery strategy. And then acknowledging the increasing importance of our digital and data strategy, a role has been created that focuses on connecting customers across our integrated services and creating enhanced experiences for our existing and potential patients, as well as enabling efficiencies uh, through our uh, changes in our operating model. And then there's a role responsible for new service lines uh, that we're developing around cancer, musculoskeletal and mental health. I'd like to thank Danny for his tremendous service to Ramsey Healthcare and congratulate Carmel on her appointment. Now moving on to an update on our European business. Ramsey Sante has continued to operate under the French government decree, which provides a guarantee of revenue from 1 March 2020 to 31 December 2020. In the first quarter of FY21, surgical volumes in France increased 5.4% on the previous corresponding period as clinicians sought to reduce the backlog of surgeries created by the first COVID lockdown. Growth in surgical volumes in the Nordics has also been strong and demand for other services has been below the prior period with social distancing requirements impacting the ability to provide services such as mental health and rehabilitation. Ramsey Sante has continued to look at the optimisation of its portfolio of facilities. To this end, the nine hospitals owned in Germany have recently been sold in two separate tranches, resulting in the exit from that market. We will, however, continue to invest in the business, including in both brownfield and greenfield projects to improve our footprint. As I've already highlighted, the business is currently focused on supporting the public system with the response to the second wave of COVID. Moving to the UK. In March, Ramsey UK led the industry discussions on making hospitals available to the NHS. In October, this agreement was formally varied and extended from 1 July 2020 to 31 December 2020, allowing for the return of some capacity for private patient activity and routine NHS selective activity. After a slow start to the first quarter of FY21, the UK has seen a recovery in private work in recent months as private health insurers and clinicians move to reduce surgical waiting lists. And there has been an increase in demand for other services such as oncology, which are flowing from the public system. We continue to be in discussions with the NHS and the UK government around both short and long-term opportunities to assist with the reduction of the public hospital waiting lists. Ramsey has continued to expand its presence in the UK, opening Ramsey Stourside Hospital in Birmingham, uh, which takes the total number of acute hospitals and day procedure centres in the UK to 34. We continue to invest in new projects, including the expansion of our hospital at Preston, an increase in bed numbers at Jacobs Neuro, and an increase in theatre and consulting room capacity at West Midlands Stourbridge. As noted earlier, we continue to work closely with the NHS to assist with managing the second wave of COVID cases in the UK. Now I'll move on to our Asian joint venture with Syme Derby. 
There were no restrictions imposed on elective surgery during the pandemic. And that's in the regions that the joint venture operates. However, movement control orders did impact patient volumes. Volumes in the first quarter of FY21 were starting to increase in Malaysia, but remained below the prior corresponding period. The recovery in Malaysia has been disrupted recently by a second wave of COVID cases and the reintroduction of a conditional movement order. Our Indonesian hospitals continue to treat government funded COVID patients. As Michael mentioned, the challenges of 2020 also highlighted the importance of being a sustainable and responsible business. In late 2019, we made the decision to go back and review and refresh our sustainability strategy. We started the refresh by going back to basics and looking at what we do and how we add value to our key stakeholders through the prism of the company's guiding philosophy of people caring for people. As part of the process, we also sought feedback from the grassroots of our organisation in terms of what they would like to see in our global sustainability strategy. So based on this feedback, under the banner of Ramsey Cares, three global focus areas were identified that aim to deliver stronger communities, healthier people and a thriving planet. We've already introduced some fantastic initiatives driven by the commitment of our team who despite the additional challenges introduced by the COVID pandemic have continued to pursue these goals. These include an initiative in Ramsey, Australia to reduce plastic waste wherever possible. We're replacing items such as plastic drinking cups uh, with environmentally friendly alternatives. Um, and so in the first five months of the program, we've avoided over 6.5 million plastic items in our Australian hospitals. Now turning to our strategy and the outlook for the group. A number of shareholders have asked us whether the issues flowing from the pandemic have changed our broad strategic direction. I believe what the pandemic has done has accelerated some of the trends that we were already seeing in the markets in which we operate and has potentially opened up new opportunities to further leverage our scale, our investment in clinical expertise and our strong relationships with key stakeholders in the sector. We will continue to look at all initiatives through a discipline return lens and believe that as well as top line growth opportunities, we can also deliver stronger shareholder returns by improving our efficiency and sustainability. This will include the further standardisation of some of our activities in order to drive the digitalisation of the business and ensure consistent operational excellence across our facilities. As outlined earlier, we will continue to invest in brownfield and greenfield opportunities across our regions to ensure we position our facilities to capture the changing dynamics of the industry and the behaviours of our key stakeholders. So in summary, Ramsey employees across our regions continue to work closely with our clinicians, the public sector and the community to respond to the challenges the pandemic has created and care for the safety and well-being of our patients. Given the uncertainties associated with the COVID environment, in particular in our Northern Hemisphere regions, Ramsey is unable to provide FY21 guidance. We continue to work with our government stakeholders regarding the role we can play in assisting to relieve the pressures on public waiting lists. We believe these opportunities could deliver additional volumes over several years as the world gradually learns to live with the virus and hopefully in time, a vaccine becomes widely available. Notwithstanding the significant near-term uncertainties, over the medium to long-term, the healthcare industry fundamentals remain positive. Given our strong position in the markets in which we operate, we are well positioned to capitalise on the shifting industry dynamics. Following the recent equity raising, the company has a strong balance sheet to invest and support new opportunities and initiatives as they arise. 
I would like to take this opportunity to thank all of our employees and doctors again for their tireless work and in many cases significant personal sacrifice to assist in the fight against the COVID pandemic. <coughs> I'd like to thank the Board of Directors for their support during the year. And I'd also like to thank all of our shareholders for your support during this period. Your company remains in a strong position to continue to be an industry leader. I'll now hand, hand you back to Michael for any questions in the formal part of the meeting. Thank you. Thanks, Craig. Um, look, as you can see from Craig's report, you know, it's been a very difficult year for not only us, but also the whole health industry. Um, and, you know, our people have worked tirelessly. I mean, harder than they've ever had to work to adapt to this new environment. And they've done it extremely well. And as I've always said, they are the best in the business. And this year, they've definitely proved it. Um, I also wanted to add to that that the board has had to work harder than ever. At one stage, we were having weekly meetings. And I want to thank them all for the extra time they've devoted to the company this year. Um, they'll certainly earn their fees this year. So we'll now move to the formal agenda of the meeting. The first item of business is the consideration of the financial report of the company and its control entities and the reports of the directors and auditors for the financial year ended the 30th June 2020. Whilst there is no resolution for this item, it is an opportunity for shareholders to ask questions, including in relation to the business and operations generally. And we have our auditor Doug Bain from Ernst & Young present to answer any questions you have in relation to the conduct of the audit. So I will now respond to any questions that we have. Henrietta, do we have some questions? Yes, Chairman, we have a number of questions on this item, which I will read out largely verbatim. Mr Zapier from Bruce ACT has asked the following two questions. When will dividends recommence and are you on track for net profits February 2021? Mr Zapier, that's the question I think every shareholder is asking at this stage. Um, as mentioned in my speech, the payment of an interim dividend for the fiscal year 21 will be considered by the board in the normal course at its meeting to approve the accounts and the release of the results in February. As per Craig and my comments, the company, company is not in a position to provide guidance for profits in the fiscal year 21, given the uncertainties in the current operating environment. But as I said, we are very keen to reinstate the dividend and we will do so as soon as we can. But thank you for the question. Next, we have Mr and Mrs Mori from Kiala, Victoria, who have asked the following two questions. When will you have a DRP plan and when will you have another rights issue? Thank you. On the first question, we don't have a DRP plan under consideration currently, as we don't really require the capital. Um, DRPs, as you know, are EPS dilutive unless the additional capital is required and invested. On the second question, as per, Craig's er as per Craig's earlier comments, our balance sheet is very well capitalised at the moment, given the capital raise in April. So at this point, we have, uh, we have no plans to raise further capital via a rights issue. Next, we have company shareholder Demir Proprietary Limited from Greenwich, New South Wales, just submitted the following question. How well was the company prepared for COVID-19? Well, I'm not sure anyone was prepared for COVID-19, to be honest. I think the whole world was taken by surprise. But as you've heard from Craig and me, our employees responded extremely well to the challenges brought on by the pandemic. We led the industry in all regions in which we operate to work with governments to combat the virus. Of course, there have been lessons learned and the UK and French businesses are putting some of those lessons into practice at the moment as they face their second wave of the COVID-19 cases in the Northern Hemisphere. So I hope that answers your question. Mr Clifton from Parkdale, Victoria has asked the following three questions. Have the COVID-19 lockdowns affected the profits of Ramsey Healthcare and to what extent? Have any employees been laid off due to the effects of the COVID-19 lockdowns? Are employees and senior staff working from home due to the lockdowns? If so, how effective has working from home proven to be? Thank you. On the first question, in the 2020 year, the business was in, fact, in effect broadly EBIT neutral for the first four months of the 30th of June. 
As you've heard in Craig's update, the virus continues to impact the company's profits in the first quarter of fiscal year 21. We're not in a position to give fiscal 20 year one, 21 profit guidance at this stage. On the second question, happily no employees have been laid off due to the, compact, the impact of the COVID-19 lockdowns. We were very lucky. On the third question, yes, we have had corporate staff in all our regions working from home during the pandemic. And this has worked effectively for the, for the main. However, many of our employees are keen to get back to the office environment and to face interaction, which will also conti continue to maintain our flexibility. And I must say, we finally had a face-to-face -face board meeting last month, and I think we're all very happy to meet each other again after all that time. Next, we have Dr Gorman from Cogra, New South Wales, who has asked two questions. The role of Chief Medical Officer involves clinical governance. Should Professor John Horvath remain as Chief Medical Officer when the New South Wales Crown Resorts inquiry showed his gross deficiencies in governance? Ramsey hospitals are involved with treating the effects of gambling on patients and their families. Should Professor Horvath remain as the Chief Medical Officer of Ramsey when he has demonstrated in the Crown Resorts inquiry that he promotes gambling? Look, I, I certainly understand where your question is coming from and I would like to point out that Dr Horvath is a very, very eminent member of the medical fraternity. And since commencing in the Chief Medical Officer role five years ago, he's played a critical role in assisting Ramsey to develop and implement programs and initiatives to enhance our performance and reputation as a global leader in the delivery of safe and high quality patient care. His extensive international experience in evidence-based practice and clinical governance has helped all our healthcare teams around the world to ensure that best practice is being achieved through collaboration and benchmarking. Prior to joining Ramsey, Professor Hel Helvath held a number of key roles, including Australia's Chief Medical Officer, he was on the board of the Garvin Institute, and he was the Principal Medical Consultant to the Department of Health and Ageing. His career has included 30 years in clinical practice at the Royal Prince Alfred Hospital, where he established a number of clinical services and served as a director of the Renal Transplant Services Unit, a very famous worldwide unit. Professor Horbath has also represented Australia's interest in the World Health Organization and was deputy chair of the International Cancer Research Institute based in France, and he was ordered the Award of Officer of Australia. Look, we're very indebted to Professor Horvath for the contributions he's made to the company. Despite his retirement in February next year, we are very comfortable with Professor Horvath performing the role of the Chief Medical Officer, and we look forward to his contributions in, to our company. Thank you. We now have Ms LeMay from South Victoria, who has asked the following question. I was recently a patient at a Ramsey Hospital in regional Victoria, Australia. I had to buy two prescriptions after my operation, which came from the hospital pharmacy for two tiny bottles of eye drops. Mm. The price was outrageous as I was a captive market. Look, I'm sorry to hear that. Um, you know, I know we all shop in pharmacies from time to time and wonder at some of the prices, but if a medication's not listed on the PBS list, that medication is classified as a non-PBS or commonly known as a private script. For private script medications, all Ramsey pharmacies use the framework provided by the National Medicare Australia as a guide for the pricing structure for those medications. Unlike PBS medications, private script medications are not subsidised by the government. That may answer your question as to why it was probably more expensive than you thought, but thank you for the question. Next, we have Mr Onley from Langford Western Australia, who has asked two questions. Where's the September 2020 dividend? And you have money to extend hospitals, so where's my dividend? Look, thank you. I think we've partially answered that question, but in light of the, as I said, in light of the uncertainties, the board and the senior management made decisions to protect the financial stability of the company and place us in a strong position to take any advantage of any opportunities that emerge from the pandemic. This included raising $1.5 billion in capital and seeking waivers from our banking syndicate on meeting certain banking covenants up to the 31st of December. So it was not appropriate to be paying out a dividend at the final result. 
as we know, hospital expansions are long-term projects that have been in planning and development usually for a number of years, and we can't, they just can't be turned on and off at a, at a whim. We have long-term obligations and the projects continue to be in the long-term best interest of all the, the shareholders. <clears throat> Your board will consider the payment of a half-year dividend in February in the normal course of business. Thank you. Next, we have Mr. Rajagopal, who is a representative of the Australian Shareholders Association. Ramsey Health share performance has been lacklustre over the past decade. What steps are you taking to ensure that your lo loyal minor shareholders, whom the Australian Shareholders Association represents, are rewarded by the company, and what is your target for improvement? Thank you for that question. Look, it's um, the share. We are very aware that the share price has been fairly static for the last few years, and that shows the significant challenges that the healthcare industry is facing. Um, we know that health insurance uh, rates are declining, and that's something w that we have to address. R at, at the moment, we are involved in quite a large strategy uh, initiative to work out where this industry is going in the future, and so I hope that strategy will come up with some answers to your questions. But I, I must say we are working very hard on that. A further question from Mr Rajagopal, so representing the Australian Shareholders Association. Your annual report already indicated the extent of the negative impact of, COVID, of the COVID pandemic on your business. You received major income support and grants from governance, governments in Australia, France and the UK. Since the publication of the report, Europe is in the grip of a second COVID wave, which is in many ways worse than the first. Can you give us an update on the scale of the impact of the second wave and the scale of the additional support you hope to receive from governments in your biggest markets? Look, thank you. I mean, we didn't ask for the support from governments. I mean, basically our hospital beds were more or less, more or less nationalised and, uh, so, and governments have given us some income um, not all of our income, uh, and so our results have, as you would expect, have suffered uh, accordingly. In relation to the second wave, I think it's a little early to call. Uh, France and the UK and, and the Scandinavian countries are now going into this second wave. We're not exactly sure what the impact's going to be. Um, we think our staff are ready because they've had the experience from the first um, wave. So, look, I think it's a wait and see. That's why we can't give guidance. That's why it's difficult to, create, to, um, to form a budget. So, unfortunately, I just have to say we just have to wait and see where this is going. I can't really give you any more of an answer than that. We have a third question from the ASA. Your industry is being reshaped by the emergence of real estate management trusts who are buying up acute care hospitals, hospital properties and leasing it back to operators like Ramsey Health. Your company has actively participated in this trend. What is the long-term strategic and financial impact on hospital operators like Ramsey, given that the real estate management trusts have been rewarded by very attractive shareholder returns? Look, I don't agree that we've participated in this, um, this uh, property sell-off. Uh, certainly in Australia, we much prefer to own our properties. In the UK and France, when we bought the companies, the properties had already been sold, so we had no choice in that matter. Um, I don't think that it does us any good, and I must say we have discussed this uh, for years as to whether we should own the properties or not. I'm not sure what benefit we get from selling the properties. It's only, the only benefit you get, you get is from what you do with the money that you, you uh, get for those properties. So at this stage, whilst we have it as a strategy that we, might, we may want to implement in the future, at this stage, we're comfortable loaning our properties and we won't be selling any more off. Next, we have a question from Mr. Coleman. Mr. Chairman, can you confirm that it is the, atten the intention of the board to hold a hybrid AGM, so physical and online, next year? We are encouraging Team Invest members to vote against the re-election of any directors of companies where the board chooses to hold only an online AGM next year. I totally agree with you. Uh, we're not doing this voluntarily. We're doing because we have to. So the sooner we can get back to a face-to-face -face AGM, we'll be there. So next year, all things being equal, we'll all be back together in, in the same room. Thanks for the question. 
A second question from Mr Coleman. In light of the still high debt to equity ratio of the company, which continues to be too high to pass the Team Invest filters, why did the board choose to scale back applications by shareholders towards the SPP? Look, this company traditionally has used debt very carefully um, and some people do think that our debt can, is too high. We've now reduced it by one and a half billion dollars currently um, and so I think it, it's, uh, it is a whole lot less than it used to be. Um, what was the rest of the question? Sorry. Let me... I just want to make sure I answer it. <clears throat> Sorry about so that. So why one. did the board choose to scale back applications by shareholders? Oh, sorry, yes. Why did we scale back? Well, look, we thought we uh, the original target was a billion dollars and we ended up with one and a half billion dollars and frankly we thought that was enough. You know, as you know, capital raisings are diluted and we didn't want to dilute the shareholders too much so that we, we drew the line at one and a half billion. Chairman, we have also received a well done from Mrs Kavanagh from Moffat Beach, Queensland, mm. and we would like to thank her for her support. Thank, thank you, you, Mrs Kavanagh. We always like the support that our shareholders give us. And that concludes the questions on this item. Thank you, Henrietta, and thank you for all those questions and the shareholders who asked them. Uh, and we'll now move on to the next item. The second item is the adoption of the 2020 remuneration report. As set out in the 2020 remuneration report, after receiving a first strike last year, we've consulted extensively with proxy advisors, institutional investors, equity analysts and other stakeholders. We appreciate the time and thought given by all stakeholders in this period of consultation. The feedback received has been valuable and we've incorporated into the ongoing evolution of our remuneration framework, sorry. I'll now respond to any of the questions that we have. Do we have any questions, Henrietta? We do. We have a further question from Mr Raja Gopal representing the Australian Shareholders Association. Mm -hmm. You have proposed to make changes to your remuneration metrics to include return on capital invested based on an adjustment to return on capital employed. The implementation of AASB 16 for lease accounting required Ramsey Health to recognise 4.5 billion of rights of use assets leading to a sharp decline in return on capital employed. Could you please give us details of the new metric so that we can review and comment on it before it is presented for approval by shareholders? Look, thank you for that question. I might hand you over to the chairman of our remuneration committee, Alison Deans, who will probably give you a better answer than I would to that question. Yeah, so I'd like to thank you for the question. Um, as you will have seen in the remuneration report, we are changing the, um, the metrics for the long-term incentive around EPS and introducing a returns uh, gateway into that component of the, of the long-term incentive. Uh, we're, we're working through the exact metrics for both the EPS ranges and also the return on invested capital, and we're expecting to disclose those once we've worked them through um, at, with the half-year reports in February. Thanks, Alison. I hope that answers the question. Uh, any more questions, Henrietta? No further questions on that item. Okay, thank you. Um, could I ask shareholders to please ensure you have cast your vote on this item? The proxy results are shown on the screen and it looks like they're overwhelmingly in favour. The third item on the agenda is the election of directors. As you're aware from the notice of meeting, I will be retiring from the board in accordance with the requirements of the company's constitution, but will be offering myself a re-election. So whilst this process is underway, I'll hand over to our Deputy Chairman, Peter Evans, to run the process. Thank you, my, Michael. As mentioned, the first director to be considered for election is Mr. Michael Siddle. Michael was appointed as cha Chairman of the company in 2014 having previously been deputy chairman for 17 years and a founding director. On behalf of the board, I strongly recommend a vote in favour of Michael's election. And I'll now respond to any questions or comments that we have received on this item. Henrietta, do we have any questions? 
Thank you, Deputy Chairman. That we do not have any questions on this item. Thank you, Hen Henrietta. Please ensure that you have cast your vote on this item. The proxy results are shown on the screen. And I will now hand back to M Michael. It's very cl clear that uh, uh, the vote is in favour of his, his re-election. Thanks, Peter, and thank you, everybody, for your support. Um, I hope I continue to do a good job. The second director <coughs> to, be, to be considered for election is Ms. Karen Penrose. Uh, I've spoken about Karen earlier. She was appointed a director on the 1st of March 2020. She's the chair of the Audit Committee and a member of the Risk Management Committee. She's a very good director and she's dedicated a lot of time this year to getting to know the company. So I strongly recommend a vote in favour of Karen's election. But why don't we ask Karen to say a few words of introduction so you can get to know her. Karen? Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Chairman, and good morning, everyone. I am Karen Penrose and virtually stand before you today seeking your support for my election to the Board of Ramsey Healthcare. Just to add a bit of colour to the details in the notice of meeting, since 2014 I have been working full time as an independent non-executive director. I made the decision to move to non-executive work after an executive career in leadership and CFO roles mainly in financial services, property and infrastructure. I am passionate about customer outcomes, financial management and well versed in operating in a rapidly changing regulatory environment, which stems from my 20 years with CBA and HSBC and more currently in aged care as well as in banking. I am just 60, a mother of two adults aged 27 and 30 and my home base is in Sydney. As we managed through COVID-19 in 2020, I've been able to visit Ramsey's Sydney hospitals in a COVID safe way, and have also spent time with our regional CEOs, Andy Jones in Ramsey UK, Pascal Roche in Ramsey Sante, and Greg Brown in Ramsey Syme Derby, to build my knowledge of Ramsey's global business, its people and culture. I look forward to being able to more freely go to our hospitals and non-surgical facilities as and when borders reopen. As Michael has said, I joined Ramsey's board in March of this year. I am your audit committee chair, which is a role that I particularly enjoy, partly through a love of numbers and partly because that role and the committee provides a window to engage with a range of talented Ramsey executives who underpin the financial health and culture of your company. I'm also a member of Ramsey's Global Risk Committee. I would like to acknowledge and thank Peter Evans, who previously led the audit committee prior to me coming on board and who continues on that committee so we make the best of a smooth transfer of knowledge within the audit committee. I mentioned earlier that I work full time as a non-executive director and apart from volunteer work that I do in mentoring women leaders and in community sport, I sit on three other listed company boards. I have chosen those companies carefully to make sure that I have enough time, especially as an audit chair, to read, think and make valuable contributions at scheduled committee and board meetings and the additional meetings that have been essential in this COVID-19 year and as we manage through COVID-19 into 2021. It also means that I see audit and audit related issues from different perspectives which adds to my effectiveness as your audit chair. Finally, I respect your support for my election and the responsibility that goes with that to work diligently with your board for the benefit of all Ramsey healthcare shareholders. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Karen. As you can see, um, Karen's an excellent director and she, I must say she's fitted into our board very well and contributed already. So I strongly recommend that we all vote for her. Are there any questions or comments on this item, Henrietta? There are no questions on this item. All right, all right. Thank you, Henrietta. So I would now urge everybody to cast your vote on this item. The proxy results are shown on the screen. And as, as you can see, they are overwhelmingly in favour. Item four is the proposed grant of 55,563 performance rights to Mr. Craig McNally. The board firmly believes that the company's long-term growth has been sustained and underpinned by a long-term incentive program. 
of aligning executive reward with shareholder wealth through the achievement of the performance conditions as described in the notice of meeting. I'll now answer any questions or comments we have on this item. Henrietta, do we have any questions? And I must say, I'm a great supporter of these uh, performance rights because I think they align the shareholder interests with the company's interests and, and sorry, the management interests with the shareholder's interests. Yes, Chairman, we have a number of questions on this item. Company shareholder EGH Enterprises Proprietary Limited from NORAT Victoria has submitted the following question. The grant of performance rights to the managing director is outrageous and unrealistic at this time. How much money are you satisfied with? Mr and Mrs Atkinson from Port Lincoln have asked a similar question regarding why performance rights should be issued to the managing director when he's already paid for doing his debt, for the job he should be doing. Thanks for the question. Look, I don't agree that, that, that it's outrageous at all, I have to say. The proposed grant of performance rights to the managing director and other key management personnel is part of our overall remuneration framework, <coughs> which the board considers appropriate in order to retain and motivate a highly skilled, capable and proven executives. And we want to keep them. We don't want to lose them. This framework comprises fixed pay, a short-term incentive which rewards performance in executing Ramsey's strategic priorities during the year, and a long-term incentive which drives long-term value for creation for shareholders. The proposed grants of performance rights will only vest if the performance hurdles of total shareholder return, return on invested capital, and earnings per share are met over the next three years. So they're not easy to get. They're, they're quite hard to get. For, for fiscal year 2021, there will be no change to the fixed pay of the managing director or any other key management personnel. And the LTI will be subject to new performance hurdles in accordance with the company's LTI strategy. As I said, this aligns the LTI strategy element of the executive remuneration with the creation of shareholder wealth by linking reward with the strategic goals and performance of the company. These are detailed in our remuneration report. In addition, for, for fiscal year 2020, the board applied discretion to adjust all STI outcomes to zero, reflecting the material negative impact of COVID-19 on the financial outcomes. And the fiscal year 2018 LTI grant that was due to vest at the end of this year for the Manning Director will not vest as the relative TSR and EPS performance metrics were not met. So as I said, these rights are not easy to get and they are significant hurdles in, in that the executive have to achieve to be granted them. But thank you for your question. Do we have another question? Next, we have Mr. Heinemann from Les Murdy WA who has asked the following question. Given that many important board decisions such as opening new hospitals are very long-term decisions that may significantly affect the company for say 100 years, why are the performance rights for the CEO based on a three-year performance? Yes, look, we've, we've looked at this. Um, the board acknowledges that many of Ramsey's important decisions are long-term decisions, and that some companies have moved towards setting four-year performance periods for their long-term incentive plan. The performance period for our long-term incentive plan was considered as part of the broader review of remuneration undertaken during fiscal year 2020, and we discussed this with our investors and our proxy advisors. So following our review and discussions, we decided to maintain the three-year performance period as we believe it is an appropriate period for the assessment of the long-term performance, as well as maintaining sufficient tension between an executive performance and the ultimate reward for that performance. I hope that answers your question. Do we have any more questions, Henrietta? No further questions, Mr Chairman. Thank you. Um, please ensure that you have cast your votes on this item. The proxy results are now shown on the screen. And again, they're overwhelmingly in favour. Item five is seeking shareholder approval for the non-executive director share rights plan and for grants of share rights to non-executive director under the plan in, the, in fiscal year 2021 to 2023. The non-executive director rights plan was last approved by shareholders at the 2018 annual general meeting. As set out in the notice of meeting, the company would like non-executive directors to have the opportunity to salary sacrifice a portion of their remuneration into share rights if they wish. 
For this reason, we are seeking approval of the non-executive director's share rights plan today. We are not granting any rights. We're giving the option to convert their salary into the rights. So I'll ask if there are any questions, Henrietta? Yes, Chairman, we have a number of questions on this item. The Searle Family Annuation Proprietary Limited from Wodonga, Victoria has asked the following question. It appears at this time unreasonable to include performance rights and at the same time have salary sacrifice for non-executives. And we have also received a related question from Mr and Mrs Atkinson from Port Lincoln, which reads, strongly disagree on approval of the non-executive rights again if they are not doing their job that they are already being paid for. Look, there's a, there's a bit of confusion here. The, the shareholder approval being sought is to allow non-executive directors an opportunity to salary sacrifice a portion of their remuneration into share rights under the non-executive director's rights plan. And it excludes our Mr McNally, who's an executive. So we are not granting any rights. We're just giving the, the non-executive directors the opportunity to convert their salary into rights. As we explained in the remuneration report, the board has determined to reduce non-executive director's fees by 20%. Accordingly, it will no longer be making the non-executive director's share rights plan award. Allowing non-executive directors to salary sacrifice their fees supports non-executive directors building share their shareholdings in the company, which I think we're all, we're all happy with, and continues to enhance the alignment of interests between the non-executive directors and the shareholders generally. So I hope that answers the two questions that we've had. And there's no further questions on this item, Chairman. Okay, thank you, Henrietta. Please ensure that you cast your votes on this item. The proxy results are shown on the screen. And again, they're overwhelmingly in favour. So, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our discussion on the items of business. And I'll shortly close the voting system for items two to five. So, please ensure you've cast your votes on these items. Now we'll pause for a short moment to allow all shareholders to finalise their votes. Voting is now closed for items two to five. Thank you for your, your patience. We'll now have another short pause for approximately 60 seconds while the results of items two to five are calculated. Once ready, they'll be, they'll be displayed on the webcast. So please bear with us for a while. Thank you again for your patience. Um, the results of the votes for items two to five are shown on the screen. And as you can see, all those resolutions have been passed for which I thank you. As we didn't receive a second strike on the remuneration report today, accordingly, we do not need to proceed with item six. So this brings us to the end of the uh, annual general meeting. And I thank you for your participation. As I said before, I really hope we'll be able to get together next year and 
again, have a cup of tea and some of those nice sandwiches that I think we provide. So I now declare the meetings closed. Thank you.